Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I know a lot of people are still going through the breakfast line, and we encourage that. But just to make sure we don't run out of time, I thought we'd get started right away. Does that sound all right? Yes, please. My thinking, too, is that today's session can really be, as much as we can, somewhat conversational. Wouldn't that be great? Because we're reunited in Reno, and that reunited is an important word. You know, when, so we're thinking, you know, on the one hand, if we have this conversational and reunited, maybe we need a group therapy session while people are finishing the breakfast. That would be one possibility. But probably more realistically, we can celebrate. If this is a celebration, that gives us a certain therapeutic element too, because what are we celebrating? We're celebrating connection, aren't we? And that connection in itself is therapeutic. If normally for a conference like this, good advice would be go out and learn. Get some new tools you can put in your teaching toolbox, right? But I'm gonna just go out on a limb and say, don't intend to learn anything this time. <laughs> it sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? <laughs> but why would I say such an audacious statement? Because instead of intending to learn, I think what we should do is just be present and connect. And that gives us the therapeutic element because we're right in the present moment, we're connecting with each other, we can really be. If we think of the learning, even though we adore learning, it's about what we do as educators, right? But in some ways that acquisition of knowledge is a fragmentation. And in contrast, just being, just connecting, that's a wholeness. So we have that learning, the acquisition of knowledge is again the brain, isn't it? But the connecting is the heart. And I think right now we need to learn to think with the heart. And that's gonna be part of our therapeutic nature. Well, it's, um, we've been through a lot, no doubt, with all of that. And if we're going to connect while we're still grabbing our coffee and our snacks and all, how about if we take a moment to connect with the person on either side of you? Just give a greeting to the person next to you. <laughs> okay, and now let's do it again, but introduce yourself by saying, I teach piano. What do you do? <laughs> I hear a whole lot of connection going on. And I'll bet it was, it, it's quite a coincidence, isn't it, that the person next to you said they teach piano too. <laughs> okay, now let's take this concept of connection and let us shift lens a little bit. Instead of us at this conference, what about if we go into our teaching studio? What is the role of connection for us as teacher and student? Anybody care to make any comment, observation? Is it important? <laughs> yes, that connection with the student is extremely important because that's really the carrier wave on which the learning will occur. So I like to think of that as foundational. So that relationship building, just being there with a the student, acknowledging their presence and their right to be, the fact that they are whole as they are, so to speak, that unconditional presence you're giving them, that gives the foundation and the safety, if you will, for then they can move on to the learning. Because when we have that kind of real thoughtful, caring connection with that student, we're providing that safety. The, the neurology of it would be that the neurotransmitters of uh, oxytocin, the prolactins, serotonin, dopamine, all these little words you might have come across, those are the good neurotransmitters that come and tell the student, I feel safe. And when they feel safe, they also can feel motivated. So it's interesting that that dopamine comes in there even in that connection, because that's the motivation. So now, being safe and settled and comfortable, now they're really ready to learn. And we're finding, and certainly in the neuroscience field, that the idea of emotions relates so much to learning, because does the learning can, uh, 
persist? Do we remember things or not? Learning will be deep when the student is engaged, right? With passion. So we need that neurotransmitters to come and almost flood the brain to prime the learning to occur. How do we do that? It's just simply being very safely with the individual. So let's keep that idea of riding that fundamental pathway. And if we go just a little deeper into the psychology of it, we might think of our young kids, right? What kind of needs do they have in order to develop beautifully, to develop really well? Well, the fundamental two needs, if we want to just bring it down to fundamentals, would be attachment and authenticity. In other words, that child needs to learn that they're safe and attached to people, right? They have people caring for them and with them. And the authenticity is the sense that they have self-agency and something of which is unique of themselves. So when we talk about music and musical expression and artistry, as we let that artistry emerge, we're letting that individual's authenticity emerge. So we're really, in a strong way, handling both of those needs. And I would maintain then that our roles in our piano teaching with the students really do contribute to that individual's development. So don't miss those. We can't let the professional skills necessarily override the foundational nurturing attributes of us as teachers. I'd like to ask a question. During the pandemic, how was your connection with your student? Yeah, I'd be really interested in just taking a moment of any stories or any observations anybody had. I know we had to all deal with it in different sort of ways, you know, and the, I think the issue is that when we're talking about this element of connection and we're accustomed to connecting with our students, all of a sudden we're thwarted on our mission of what we do, right? So it's like we get our frustrated path because we can't provide those components to the, to the students that we know they need or else it's faltered, it's like interrupted and then that's frustrating. And so all of these things add to a little bit of the angst and the uncertainty and discomfort that we all have felt over the last four years. Anybody have any particular experiences to share? Yeah. I would just say that we, uh, it, it's, it's so awkward, as we all know. Uh, but one of the things that helped me is I thought, okay, I'm going to just have a musical joke. Every week I'm going to come up with something that I find that, that, that will make them laugh before we get started. And that helped a lot, of course. But I love that because what you're doing is you're maintaining that kind of an upbeat feel, right? We had offset elements of safety. I like that even just a telephone call, that contact to make sure that connection maintains and persists is so important. Any other observations, stories? Well, I wasn't sure how it was going in the real time. After we went back to in-person lessons, I had more than one parent tell me that the piano lessons on Zoom were the one grounding thing that their children had. So Isn't the feedback something? from the families was completely different from what I thought was going on. Yeah, because yeah, wouldn't you anticipate that they would be complaining, but it still was maintaining the connection? I had an interesting, couple interesting stories around the pandemic. Uh, one, I had the misfortune, I guess you could say, of being in China when the pandemic broke out. Oh, and I wow. barely made it back to the US. I was judging the Macau International Piano Competition. But, but what was really interesting is we had about 2,000 entries and the finalists performed with an orchestra. And uh, the winner was from Australia and her teacher was in Germany. This is pre-pandemic and all of her lessons were by Zoom. And this is really high level. Then you think, okay, well, if she played maybe a Rachmaninoff piano concerto, maybe, you know, with a pedal and everything, you could cover up some of those little nuances that you wouldn't get on Zoom. But she played a Mozart piano concerto. So winning on Mozart, but with a Zoom lesson, I would never have guessed that. That was pre-pandemic, right? Because the pandemic hit right around, right? The next day as things were shutting down. But that gave me a little encouragement that, you know, we can, we can still connect with our, children, our students and we can make this work. So not that I'm a strong advocate of the Zoom, but certainly it can help. And I think some of you know that what we did to help is we created the Teacher Atlas as a quick solution so that you have a digital set of all the, all the Piano Adventures favorite books that you can just call up on your screen while you're teaching. So that's still available. We've added other support on that. But that was something that we did as a quick, quick fix, you might say, for, as a tool. So we yeah, have interesting times, and it's, uh, it's great to be back to some normalcy. 
Well, yeah, back here. Oh, sure. I just had a quick story to share. Um, yeah, at the beginning of the pandemic, I made, uh, I put together one project that I think really saved my studio. Because um, when the pandemic hit, we were supposed to have a recital like that weekend. And I figured, okay, let's, let's make a positive out of this. So I just emailed everybody and said, oh, there's a lockdown, so we're canceling the recital, but we're going to do a YouTube recital instead. Everybody send your videos. So while the world was falling apart, uh, everybody got to see a, a virtual recital. I think we were one of the first studios to have a virtual recital like that. Um, and I still get comments today that everybody felt like that was such a sort of like bright light in the scariness, and it felt like we were all together, even though we are all at home like watching each other on YouTube. So uh, that's my story. I love your story. I think it's really great. You know, we like to use the theme, be adventurous, right? And the be adventurous, when the pandemic hit, I was to do a workshop and the, the state of Michigan closed down, all travel, closed, we couldn't even go to the Institute. So all my tech crew wasn't there and I had to pull out my laptop in my living room and do a, a show right there, right? But the fact that you do the adaptation that's needed is stepping into the unknown. And so I kind of flipped the whole a webinar towards metaphor of what's familiar and safe and what is novel and a little bit out there. Requiring, it's like the familiar, we can ride on all of our neural habits, right? But as soon as you go into this unknown, now we have to be adaptive. We have to be thinking a little outside the box. And you're, you did a great example of how do you adapt? And then using the fact that you're adventurously stepping into that unknown, but just do it with your gut, right? Adventure is toward the gut, ventral facing. So moving in with the courage, and then you just see what works, but you're, you're, be, you're showing yourself agency to confront the situation, and that's a model for your students, and everybody feels safer. And then you've got some new tools in your toolkit. So well done, appreciate it. I watch his video. Oh yeah. I watch his YouTube. <laughs> I got the idea. I got the idea from your YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a socio a sociology model. That isn't a, that is not just interpersonal, but you actually lead with invitation by being adventurous. So, what I'm hoping we can do is over the next years is we're seeking to be adventurous as the company, Nancy and I and all our team, and to go a little bit venturing into the unknown and create new solutions. The, one of the things we're celebrating is our connection, of course, but it happens to be the 30th year for Piano Adventures. Isn't that kind of hard to believe? So, yeah, uh, all I can say is I'm, I'm glad we started when we were young. <laughs> so, but 30 is a, is a really cool number because at first I thought, wow, this is like, you know, that's meant a lot of years of hard work. But it's another generation, isn't it? Because 30 represents a generational change. Does anybody here with us back in the early days when we were launching pre-time to big time. Oh yeah, so, and how about when we were launching Piano Adventures for the very first time, coming out with that 30 years ago, you know, when the primer level first just hit the bookshelves. You know, so great to have you with us through all these years. Is there anybody here who learned on Piano Adventures and is now a teacher? <laughs> uh, look at this, more, uh, this is, that's, <laughs> confirmation, that's great. That's uh, wonderful to see. Well, I wanna just communicate that from Nancy and myself, how honored we are to be in your studio day to day. It really is an honor that you took us in. When, you know, when we started you know, in our youth and everything, you're presenting Piano Adventures, it was kind of like we came to you with what we created, our method. But now the shift is that you've used it for these years. You know all these tricks and you've got ways to work with your student. So now it's your piano adventure, right? So what we wanna do going forward with this next 30 years, we're kind of shifting our mindset. Now we're together on this piano adventure. And our piano adventure is profound, isn't it? What are we really doing? We're making piano teaching and learning more accessible, enriching, and a transformative path to beauty and spirit. So when we can work together on such a profoundly important mission, that gives us the courage to be adventurous. So bear with us as we sometimes just try things and we want your feedback, because now we're doing it together. We're being adventurous. And there's a big world out there of change. It just as the technology sometimes is scary to us because it takes the students' attention away and is changing their brain and we're getting minds that go into like little squares instead of really reaching out. 
So we have to offset those deficiencies. And in many type ways, piano is the antidote to this onslaught of digitization, isn't it? And at the same time, as we learned in the pandemic, if we didn't have Zoom, if we didn't have our phones and FaceTime or whatever, imagine how awkward or how horrible, really, the, a catastrophic the pandemic would have been. So technology saved the day for us also. So we're really looking at trying to sort those elements out, keeping technology away where it's detrimental, but finding just the right applications and tools that we can introduce technology in a way that enhances our mission of developing musical minds and hearts. And we're developing musical and minds and hearts together. Well, I'd like to take a moment and share just some new product, because what we're doing now is looking at, we still do have new publications, but also new support and new services. So that's the idea, a full gamut of working together for the developing musical minds and hearts. This is not in your pack, so you can keep drinking your coffee, but I wanted to share something. <laughs> this uh, Disney always takes a little time. They need approval on how many stars on the covers and all of that, so they're still getting okay on the cover. So we have at the booth some, uh, pilot co some copies of these for your viewing pleasure, um, but we still need that approval from Disney before we pull the trigger on the press. So why adult Disney? Why, why would we need an adult Disney? Because you know, you know we've got the Disney for the kids, right? We've got our pre-time to big time, six levels, and those are so motivational, and they've been good Amazon bestsellers and all. But why for the adults? Yeah, they love it. That's probably a good one right there, isn't it? <laughs> if they like it, that's good enough reason. And we were talking connection. So there's kind of two elements of connection here. For that adult, they're connecting to their past, right? They connect, ah, I remember when I was at a, you know, maybe watching Bambi or whatever, you know, whatever it may be. But there's certain things there that surpass time, transcend time. So internal connections to memories is, is powerful emotionally. And the other thing is the adult wants to connect with their children, right? Or they want to connect with their grandchildren. So if they can play some of these tunes, then that just gives them another element of the social connections as well. Now, the question is, how do you do something that's expressive when it's so easy? The student's starting out. So we take this theme from Frozen, this do you want to build a snowman? So just simple, single lines. <laughs> So there's some connection happening, isn't there? And in fact, there's another element of connection because we're connecting with the sound. And this is something that we aim for with all our students, right? We want to bring their attention to the sound they're creating. I like to think of a couple words relating to that. Attunement is a good word, right? We tune the piano, so, but we don't seem to tune our ears. We just tune the piano and then we play notes and we're not listening. So we have to get our students to be attuned to the sound. If for adults, sometimes I'll talk about that this tone actually resonates. That's another great word, isn't it? It resonates not just in the instrument, but it resonates in our own gut, speaking of adventurous and ventral. But it comes right through our body. And that's not so unusual. The ancient Greeks really talked a lot about that, of this kind of resonance between even the sun, moon, and stars, and they wanted to get really ethereal on it. But we connect to that expressive sound, and that's part of the transcendent beauty and the transcendent spirit that we're talking about. So how might we push that even a little farther? Well, notice that a lot of times with these early level pieces, we do augmentation. In other words, could we have written this in eighth notes? We could, but we know what would happen, right? The student would bog down at the end of the measure, it would be a mess. But by using quarter notes here, we're inviting the slow practice. By very nature, just take it slow. And we can take the adult, we can say, look, this is your piece now. You're going to play this your way. Let's just take it really slowly. Mm -hmm. 
So we still have this expressive, don't we? And not just still, but sometimes it's even more expressive. Because instead of the student thinking, I gotta get to that next note, what does that do? It pulls us out of the present time. And if we're not in the present time, we can't be attuned with the sound that's there. At an advanced level, a really good trick is to help the student after they play something, let's just say they're playing a chord, they're, okay, it's not done, is it? Ah, it's still playing, it's still resonating. So now if I have a low note, I can match it, you can match your tone. So with that decay, I'm adding to the decay. So we're actually building on the residual sound, not just attack, attack, attack. So back to our early level student, it's not getting to the next note, but it's really being there, being in the present, connecting with the pitch that's playing. And that is a huge start on that personal artistry. So I like to say for the adults, we're working on personal piano, personal artistry. And that can be profound for them. So at any age, really, we get the sense of, of, of development of the individual. So this book has just, of course, a lot of uh, the great uh, Disney tunes and, and some pedagogical sections too so that we have addressed this key of C, key of G and so on and the blockbusters and something like a Beauty and the Beast again gives some great connection for the student. jumping to the end. Some uh, new books come, that have come out now and at the press. Again, we have these at the booth for your perusal. Sight reading. So we're moving from connection to maybe pattern recognition, a type of connection. How do we have the students really progress in their sight reading? We need some extra boosters, would you agree? What Nancy and I found with our first exploration in the sight reading was when we wrote the Piano Adventures Christmas books. Do you remember those? And we have sight reading stocking stuffers. And what was the essence of those stocking stuffers? They were little snippets that built on the same lyrics, the same rhythm and elements of the melody. So what happens then, since the student is seeing the same thing again, they can sort between what is similar and what's different. And if we see the similarity often, then we get the chunking that occurs, right? They start to understand these chunks that frees up attention to catch what's different. So you can see what happens as a person progresses in the ability to read. At the start, they get so zeroed in on attention note to note to note. But as we get them to see more expansively, see the directions, take in more patterns that are familiar, then that frees attention to look for the differences. So we first seek similarities. And if we go only to difference, but the student doesn't have a repertoire, uh, uh, routinized chunks that they're already working with, looking for the differences doesn't even make any sense. We need to build the repertoire of similarity. That's why in Piano Adventures, we do so much continually rehearsing the same thing in different settings so that they're seeing these chunks. So with that in mind, we came out with a Piano Adventure sight reading books a few years back, and those are variations on the lesson book pieces. So we have six variations on each Piano Adventure piece. So then those patterns then are really getting rehearsed and grooved in, I think. So we thought, well, what if we did the same with the literature books? So you're probably familiar with our uh, Piano Adventures uh, Developing Artist Literature Series right uh, on the left here, a preparatory piano literature book one and book two, three, four, but we paired a sight reading book then for each of those. So that with every piece that's in the literature book, we get its counterpart in a, a preparatory, um, yeah, excuse me, a, a sight reading exercises, a set of variations. So we've got the little march, the And there's some patterning there, not the least of which is one to five, one to five, isn't it? Then five, one, five, one. But let's look then at taking this into some variations. So we take this piece and we're gonna do six variations. You can do one each day if you like, 
however you want to organize it with your student. But here we go, we have So did we catch the similarity, right? And so we're building that repertoire, you might say, of note patterns. So it's next one. The one to five is still one and to five. And notice what we have here is all left hands. So we're building some left hand scale, picking up what they saw as the melody in the piece itself, but now seeing that same pattern into the uh, left hand. Moving into the next level up here, with this little prelude and talk about a pattern and we get this wonderful pattern sequence kind of. So our first order of business, of course, is to block this out, right? And see how these patterns relate. And we can do that then with our sight reading variations so well. Here we have variation one, where we have the block chords in the left hand. And then a little inversion coming over the top. And then we can take this through many variations here, the contrary motion, but still, of course, the same chords. Uh, a little bit of a waltz accompaniment for the same. And then jumping here, to variation six, so we get a little different character, but. Now, what do you think will almost inevitably happen as a student moves through these variations? Well, those patterns become not just visual patterns, but they're in the ear and their fingers, and we're mapping it out on the keyboard, aren't we? So we're getting keyboard patterns. The students can almost inevitably start writing their own variations. So it's a wonderful way to move from that kind of perceptual learning into the analysis and then moving to creative applications and now instead of just one piece for the expression, we get all these variabilities and variations on the expressive nature that each of these variations can do. So it's a full involvement of that whole perceptual system, isn't it? And bringing in the heart for the expression. So powerful tools that are in your hands. Questions, yeah. Um, is it intended to be during, while you're working on that piece? Yeah, so it is. One, I like the idea. We typically do it after the students had a week on the main piece, just to kind of get the model in their ears and they're familiar with it. And then we say, okay, now next week while we're reviewing the piece and we're putting our polish on it, I want you to do one of these variations every day. And they all have repeats, right? So they do it and they do it again. If they like it, they can play it more. And you can do different things on it. Sometimes I use it right in the lesson also, because I want to see how they're doing and then I can coach what are they picking up, lock it into some chord patterns or whatever or maybe we write chord names on the top, some other ways that they're building pattern recognition. So there's a lot of flexible ways to do it, but the typical way is just do one a day. In our sight reading books for the Piano Adventures, we just do one a day and you put a big X through it when they're done. They love just completing it. And when they get done with this, like what, 96 pages of sight reading, you know, just for that one level of the book. So this is a wonderful way to, to build that into the lesson without you having to monitor so much of everything. We can't hear everything all the time. So you can spot check, you can coach, and that one a day will keep them at it. Another question here? Yeah. Could um, they, could these be used in a group lesson? Could, could the friends who 
Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, group lesson, that's where you want to have things in common, but you want to remember the, you, your attachment and authenticity. What is the student doing uniquely? And then some students are more advanced than others, so how do you match that? Well, each giving them their own variation to learn can be really good. And then sort and swap. Wonderful idea. And if you're doing this well with the variations, you can usually come, uh, either improvise or set up some kind of ensemble right on the spot, can't you? And the students can figure out what to do. So now you can do it into parts. So really good tools. Thank you very much. The, uh, we were talking about expression. The students need models of the expression, don't they? So I just pulled up off from our Instagram. This is the same piece we just did the variations on. So this is from our Prep Lit 1, the little prelude by Scheidt. And this is uh, from our YouTube channel and Instagram. This is Amber, the director of the Faber Institute. And uh, here we go. Raise your hand there in the back. Thank you, Amber. And Amber, along with Nancy, leading our Instagram. Uh, just a great place to go for little musical nuggets that inspire, right? Students of any age, they can hear easy pieces or hard pieces, but if they're not hearing artistry, then they don't have the models to orally imitate. So it can be very helpful. Also, our Piano Adventures YouTube channel. I'd like to shift a little bit into something new. This one is in your pack, so if you've got a free hand and you want to dig into it, you can pull out the unit level assessments for the primer level. So what is this all about unit assessments? We have the Piano Adventures unit by unit, and so what we want to do now is ensure that when we teach the students something that it's retained, right? Because we have this assumption that we teach, we speak, so the student has learned it, but those don't always go together, right? It, it depends on how passionate the student, how emotionally engaged they are, whether this is important enough to retain. So we need to have certain review and some little spot checks can help. So this is a resource that we created for that kind of spot checking as you go unit to unit. You can use it, skip it, you can use little bits of it when you need it, or you can make it part of the standard routine. Um, but I think you'll find it very enjoyable. And, uh, Let's uh, <clears throat> bring up our guests to be able to uh, present on this. This is Autumn Zander. Thank you, Autumn. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see so many faces in person and not have our Zoom, Zoom screens uh, in between us. And uh, as we continue to look at just different ways to uh, connect with our students, these formative assessments are just wonderful opportunities to do so. And. Uh, as Randy was sharing, there are just opportunities to really connect with what our students are learning and, and if they're comprehending the, the content and any ways that we need to maybe reassess and help them along the learning stages. And you know, these unit assessments are more than just quizzes. There's so many opportunities for students to show what they know. And um, throughout all of the units, there are opportunities for pattern awareness. So students can go through and um, look at ways to review note names within pattern groups, opportunities for improvising with musical patterns, and identifying patterns through steps and skips. We've got opportunities for ear training. So little short, back, short playback melodies that students can copy, um, awareness for higher and lower sounds in the uh, beginning units of the primer level, and then uh, melodic patterns that they can be exploring as well. We've got opportunities for rhythm skills. So explorations of rests and note values, as well as uh, tapping rhythms with ties and other rhythm patterns that they're going to be experiencing throughout the primer level units. 
And uh, reading basics, not only are we fostering the connections with just the, um, the rhythms and the patterns, we're also getting into the fundamentals with directional reading, note names, and so many other concepts that students are experiencing. And a fun element of these unit assessments are the opportunities for students to experience one of their pieces in a deeper level. We have these adventure learning challenges that are present at the end of each of the assessments. And it's an opportunity to take a piece like, for example, the um, into the cave and explore it on a deeper level through added dynamics or perhaps other pieces where their students are exploring new hand positions and taking those pieces and getting a, a deeper exploration throughout them. And while these unit assessments are great ways to see what our students know and help them in areas that uh, they may need extra assistance with, they're also wonderful opportunities for fun. And at the end of each unit assessment, we have our mascot trophy congratulating our students on a job well done, as well as a fun opportunity for a little musical hide and seek where they can be searching for musical terms found throughout the picture. And you know, the unit assessments, uh, depending on the student, uh, they take about 10 minutes and uh, they're a great addition to the end of each unit and maybe um, a supplementary piece if they need a little reinforcement throughout there. In honor of the Piano Adventure's 30th anniversary, uh, you're getting a sneak peek at the unit assessments as you all have in your packet. And you're part of a special group of teachers that are receiving this. It's not widely available to the general public yet. And you have a special role in helping to shape this product. And if you look on the inside cover, you'll notice that there is a QR code. And we invite you to use the assessments in your teaching. And when you've had some opportunity to review them and use them with your students, we invite you to uh, scan the QR code and take the survey uh, that we have available. And your feedback and suggestions will directly impact the uh, future directions of this product. And we just really look forward to hearing your suggestions uh, as we continue to create new products for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you very much. And just highlighting the fact of the exploratory and the services and the next 30 years of working together, that picks up on what Autumn was saying, is we really appreciate your input. If you'd like to be part of special pilot tests, we welcome your participation. You have in your pack scale and chord books and the hand in favor. I don't want to take too much time on all this, although we could have a full hour session indeed on them. But <clears throat> this is, um, these are important books that I wanted you to be able to get familiar. How many have already been using these regularly? Well, great, so there's some familiarity. I wanted to highlight first, instead of beginning to the end, let's go right to the scale book three. It's, it could almost be a standalone book. So if you have a student in the intermediate, early advancing level, or even advancing, this is an essential book. The name is Harmony in Motion, okay? And let's think about that in a minute. Harmony in Motion, we're taking the structure of harmony, but we're putting it into flow, aren't we? So if we take a C minor chord, when we just play the chord, that's just static structure. But if we do, if we do cross hand arpeggios, as we do at that two way, suddenly that harmony goes in motion, right? If we take a C chord, that was outlining these pitches of C, right? There's outlining the G. So we outlined the one chord and then we outlined the five chord. That's harmony in motion. So even the melody often outlines the harmony. So we want to develop this meaning of scales. And scales can sometimes be very meaningless if we're not careful. We want to give that meaning we, or meaning, we might say, to each pitch. And what pitches do we highlight in Piano Adventures at even level 2B to get started with the full scales? It's the step 1, 5, 1 and 5, tonic and dominant. And then we do that early on with primer, I mean level 1, don't we? But 
but it's also a leading tone has meaning. So we'd also know step six has meaning too, doesn't it? Because it's relative minor. So, so end of this book, one, five, seven, one, five, seven. Those all lock together. They all have meaning within our key. So take a look at something like this exercise. And then we transpose it and through a lot of keys. <laughs> so notice we went from this kind of one up to the leading tone, five, one. And leading tone in five is forming our five chord. So we're hearing the meaningful essence of each pitch in the scale in the right context. That's a very different mode of learning scales than just blasting through hands together just to do some finger building, right? So harmony and motion has another little element of it in that we say in motion means we're taking the gestural aspects of playing. So we really get precision in how we handle our scales and arpeggios, not just blatting out finger work, but we're gonna do more of gestural approach with our alignment and so on. So this book will take us through all of that. I love this little exercise because if you take a scale and we just cluster it out, notice we get this tritone here, don't we? We get our leading tone coming up and step four wants to pull down. So that's one part of the scale. But the other part is the one, two, three, forming our nice major third. All whole steps, all whole steps. So sometimes when we think the student has to think, okay, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. You get lost in that. But if you can just chart out here, these sections here for my nice one, and then now my nice five sevens of these tritones, suddenly the whole piano keyboard is mapped out in meaning. So put our one and five with it. One, five, one, five. Mm. And then how about this? Doesn't that work out nicely? And then we'll take it through all the keys. And, and so forth. And especially when you get into the key of B and E and so far, it makes them suddenly be so easy because we're just simply blocking out and repeating the same patterns over and over, but with meaning. So this is the sort of essential change of perceptual learning that can take place if we learn these scales in a little different way. So I encourage you to take your way through the book. Um, lots of great elements in there and there's lots of video demonstrations. So you can use the videos to share with your student or you can look up the same videos yourself to see what exactly are the close-ups of the motions, what's the essence of this. And of course, uh, those are available online. One thing I really want to highlight is the chapter, the unit seven, the section seven for each of these books. There's a chord progression areas and the books are worth it just for the last unit alone because they're really locking in these chord patterns of one, six, four, five, or one, five, six, four, putting them through some different patterning and always in different keys. So it's extremely helpful. Scale book two, just jumping to here we get our scales and with some cadences, but then notice the challenges. Each scale has a challenge with the transposition opportunities. So again, this one's stressing the leading tone and then that five, the dominant five, five, one. So again, meaning to each pitch. And then jumping to our end, we get the different chord patterns off of our functional harmony. And then we put those into accompaniment patterns and then we can take them through different sort of cadences, both classical and pop, and culminating in that nice cadence here uh, for happy birthday. So your students aren't left with a doctorate degree in piano performance, but they need the score for happy birthday. So we're gonna get that in all keys early on. Okay? <laughs> scale book chord, or scale chord book one is kind of prep, it's five finger scales with improvisation transpositions, just a great way to get started. But I do want to especially highlight that scale book three for being so effective. Hand and favor, I'll leave that one to your perusal on your own. Great stuff in there because the modern piano has a much stiffer action, doesn't it? Then this is our old 1860 Broadwood at the Faber Institute. And that was the very vintage of exactly the vintage of uh, Hannon's piano. And Hannon was an organist, actually was a piano, so he didn't really care about the nuance, we had light action and you could play the piano much like an organ technique, finger only. But now with our new instruments, we need more arm weight. We need more going on here. So let's get to the fundamentals of virtuoso technique, bringing it in early. So the Faber Hannon will pick up essential gestures at the beginning. And then instead of diving right into the exercise, we do these preps 
that take in the circular motions or the rotation or repetitions, uh, whatever is appropriate. Uh, something like this one's kind of interesting. You know, what will students normally do? You get this kind of banging on that thumb, right? And we know to make this more beautiful and technically proficient, we want you almost have to dance through the thumb. So the prep exercise here would be doing just that. We get this light thumb, light, light, dee -da, dee -da, da, bum, and then over the top. And then when you move that into the piece, it just makes a completely difference of erasing the tension out of the playing, and then we get speed and coordination. So a real dynamic book, and uh, our newest edition, we have QR codes on every page, so you have uh, very close-up models as well. So great stuff. Home site, this is our website, Be Adventurous. That's our kind of our call to action, right? To be adventurous, try new things. Uh, some of you are familiar with the Teacher Atlas. Just go to the resources on the Piano Adventures webpage. This is a virtual bookshelf. So you have access digitally to the entire Piano Adventures and Faber libraries. And of course, this is also where you can get many, many videos. Here we are in the Atlas homepage. So in addition to just going to any level down there below, and that'll take you to all books at each level, you can go right to Technique and Artistry. In the Technique and Artistry, we have hundreds of uh, videos <clears throat> that go right with all the technique secrets, all the artistry pieces, yeah, all the literature books I've recorded and are available scrolling with the score. So you've got tremendous resources there. So really work on the sensitivities of the issues from touch to sound. So it's a great course for you, and we'll keep uh, adding more to all of these areas. The creative improv is our new area, and we populated that with quite a number of videos so that you have several improvisation creative exercises at each level, and we're continuing to add it. And uh, we've already done three or four webinars on it, so we'll turn this more into a full course for you. I know it can be scary to think of improvisation, can't it? And that's why the resource is there for you so that together we can cover that by giving you tools. <clears throat> Don't be intimidated by improvisation because the student will see that you're exploratory, you're adventurous, that's the model for them to be adventurous. If you just nail it all over the keyboard, they're gonna be intimidated, think they're talented, you're not, I'm getting out of here, right? So it's to your advantage not to be very good at it. I really mean that. But show that you're interested and you're curious and you're learning along with them and you'll find that the students will do really well and let them surpass you on improvisation. That's what we want, right? I'd like to bring up Brian de Blasio, my colleague on Creative Improv. And Brian, you want to say a few words? It's a pleasure being here and working with Randy and being an adventurous in a different way at the piano. And again, the Creative Improv is a safe space to just slightly tiptoe out of bounds with all the rep you've already been working on in the method. And it gives you avenues that are controlled avenues where the student can just explore maybe three notes, maybe five notes, maybe black keys, maybe white keys. So again, it's not too intimidating. And uh, I think we're going to wrap it up today by uh, actually nailing it all over the keyboard, doing the best we can. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll throw quote, quote together. unquote. <laughs> so maybe not appropriate for your eight-year-old, but uh, I thought it would be a fun way to wrap things up and uh, improvise over a couple of tunes in the method. And the first one being the Herbie Hancock timeless tune, Watermelon Man. There we are. Okay, ready for some Watermelon Man? So let's start it out just with the student hands. This is in your pack, by the way. Check out Faber uh, Studio Collection, level 2B. And if you want to grab that, we're going to just jam on page 24. Okay, page 24. Now let's hit it.
<laughs> Thanks, and we'll wrap it up with something really kind of fun and bastard. This is Queen's crazy little thing called Love, page 10, if you got it. Two, three, four. <laughs> Thanks all for being here. Wonderful to see you. And we'll see you shortly at the booth, okay? Enjoy the rest of the conference.